Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here in one more session of our Quantum Research Center seminar. Um, today, um, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Andrea Alberti from the University of Bonn. He's the senior scientist and principal investigator at the University of Bonn. Um, his expertise is in the field of experimental quantum physics for manipulation and control of individual atoms. And his research work has focused on quantum walks, simulation of topological phases, fundamental tests of quantum mechanics. Um, so it's really interesting work that um, he's been doing in his group. He's a member of the Young Academy in North Rhine, Westphalia, and is a recipient of the Rudolf Kaiser Prize 2017 for experimental tests of quantum superposition state. So that's really, um, that's really, it's really exciting. And, 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 and we're very happy to have you here, Andrea. I thank you once again for your kindness to be here with us. So please go ahead. Thank you. Alejandro, thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. And uh, I feel delighted uh, and thrilled to be here, part of the uh, Quantum Research Center seminar series uh, at the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. I wish I could visit you in person, but that's how it is now. Um, so again, thank you very much for this invitation to you. Um, the talk I'm going to present today is about two recent experiments we have carried out in my group at the University of Bonn. And these experiments um, deal with some uh, fundamental questions about how fast we can perform quantum operations. What does determine the quantum speed limit that uh, ultimately uh, set the time or the minimum time for accomplishing a certain operation? These are uh, questions that are of fundamental character and inherently related to the dynamics that is dictated by the Schrodinger equation. But besides this fundamental interest, there is also some technological relevant aspect beyond this question, namely the fact and something that we are well too familiar here, I believe in this audience, uh, with the fact that uh, there is the coherence. And that coherence limits the number of operations that we are able to perform within uh, coherence time. So there is a clear technological interest in speeding up the, uh, the rate of processing information or performing operations in time to beat the coherence. And uh, also for the practical, uh, from a practical perspective and as an experimentalist, one would like to know how hard should I still optimize the system before I hit uh, some fundamental limit and beyond that uh, there is no point I really insist. So the way we tackle this question is looking at the fast dynamics of uh, matter waves, so this is our specialty, and just to set the stage on giving you the feeling of what uh, we are uh, going to do or I'm going to present to you. So we consider the dynamics of a wave packet, in this case here in the illustration, you see it's preparing the first excited state, and then suddenly we shift the lattice potential and this excite a matter waves. And this matter waves start to evolve and we want to establish tools and techniques that are able to quantify the evolution rate and to answer this question, what determines the limit of the evolution of such uh, matter waves. So the first to address a similar question um, is a famous mathematician back already in the late uh, uh, 1600s. So, and this is a uh, French mathematician, Johann Bernoulli, who at the time addressed uh, the scientific community with a challenge. I, Johann Bernoulli, addressed the most brilliant mathematician in the world. Nothing is more attractive to uh, nothing is more attractive to intelligent people than an honest, challenging problem whose possible solution will bestow fame and remain as a lasting monument. These were the words of uh, Johann Bernoulli. At that time, it was not so unusual to have this uh, type of challenge um, published. 
And to this uh, uh, challenge, participated several of the best minds uh, of that uh, time, including his uh, arch rival, his brother uh, Bernoulli, and uh, De L'Hôpital, and other famous uh, mathematician, including Newton. All of them presented a valid solution with different type of approaches. Uh, the problem uh, specifically was to find uh, the best way to uh, let a massive body slide down from point A to point B in the shortest possible time. And uh, one possibility, perhaps the way too naive possibility, was to choose um, a straight line as a curve. But this indeed uh, is not optimal. And already Galileo Galilei, before Bernoulli, um, realized that fact that indeed is advantages to acquire a certain uh, speed through a, a fast acceleration in the beginning, uh, paying the price for a longer curve to minimize the time. However, this is also not optimal, and the optimal solution is something in between and has been found out to be the cycloid. And uh, just to convince you that this is really the case, this uh, uh, little animation showing that indeed it's uh, our cycloid, uh, the winner, you know, the little competition. This is the, the classical uh, famous brachistochrone problem of Johan Bernoulli. And when it comes to quantum, um, I think here in the audience or immediately uh, comes to mind uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty uh, principle that relates time and energy. When we speak of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, this is a very well posed uh, type of relationship when it comes to um, position and momentum as these both are uh, observable and there is no problem. However, when uh, we consider uh, the, the similar relation for time and energy, there is a caveat here. And the caveat is namely the fact that uh, time is not an observable. Um, like energy is. And this already back then at the time Heisenberg introduced this relationship, uh, posed some uh, questions and was source of great uh, debate. And it was uh, only later to Soviet uh, physicists, Mandelstam and Tam, and I'll show you in a moment, that found a way to pose this problem in a more rigorous uh, setting. What these uh, two uh, physicists consider is namely the evolution of the overlap of the quantum state with the state at time zero. And ask the question, how does this uh, physical quantity that in principle one can measure, and indeed I'm gonna present you experiments showing how we can measure this, how is this physical quantity constrained? And so we know that for a very short time, this must be equal to one, and indeed at zero time it's uh, one for a unitary evolution. And uh, at some point, uh, this quantity can reach a zero. So when the state get to an orthogonal state with respect to the original state, and we know from Heisenberg that this time must be something related to uh, H bar divided by the uncertainty. So the energy uncertainty. However, this is not so clearly specified with Heisenberg and we will see how Mandelstam and Tam uh, find a solution to this. One possibility would, would be to consider a simple, naively uh, consider a simple straight line. Uh, but this indeed uh, turns out to be uh, wrong, as it is well known in the quantum Zeno community for a very short time. Uh, this uh, overlap uh, must uh, follow a quadratic behavior in time. And in fact, the quadratic coefficients is indeed related to the energy uncertainty. So we know this must uh, have the shape of a parabola, but perhaps we can make this uh, curve even something falling steeper. Can we perhaps use these extra terms here to get even faster? And the answer to this is unfortunately no. And this was uh, the finding of Mandelstam and Tam who identified a bound that excludes all these regions. So it tells us that this overlap um, well, of the time evolved state with the state of the origin uh, 
cannot uh, decrease faster than what is set here by this curve. And thanks to Mandel's time and time, we also know how to specify exactly this prefactor. So we now that we now know that the minimum time to reach an orthogonal state, what is called orthogonalization time, is equal to pi over two times h bar divided by the energy uncertainty. Now, this bound must be fulfilled by any quantum system that uh, follows the Schrodinger equation. And uh, in particular, we have uh, instances where this bound is exactly saturated. And this is well known in the literature on quantum speed limit. And this is the case of resonant Rabi oscillation. When we have a two level system, please. So Andrea, one question to see if I'm following you. So the, the, origin, the origin of these bounds, so you say that they can be derived just from the from Schrodinger's equation. Yes. But, but like, so with any Hamiltonian, I mean, with any Hamiltonian, there's no assumptions on the type of Hamilton. The Hamiltonian can be time dependent, of course, and you know, like whatever Hamiltonian you have plus Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's equation, then you have to satisfy this bound. Am, am I, is my understanding correct? That's correct. So in the first to... place, what we are going to consider here is the case of a unitary uh, time evolution. And this holds for any static Hamiltonian. And this already anticipates, in a way, the second part of the talk, where we are going to consider time dependent. Uh, well, time so dependent. where we introduce a drive. And then we will see how a different uh, story uh, develops uh, from there when a drive is included. Uh, yes. But historically, right. how Mandelstam and Tom introduced this uh, was to consider time independent system. And but, thank you for this thank question. You. But, th but then who's delta E actually? Because so this delta E depends on the Hamiltonian, right? Like you have an initial state, you have a final state, and then like how, how do you precisely d define this delta E or, or is there some ambiguity in its, uh, I guess, no, but no. Uh, it's me who Th fails to no... see it. <laughs> no. Now, thank you also for this question. So delta E is uh, well-defined. There is no ambiguity as this refers to an observable and it's the Hamiltonian or the energy. And this is, uh, if you want, is the, is the standard deviation or the square root of the variance of, uh, of the energy operator of the Hamiltonian evaluated on the initial state. I see. So I, see. I said okay. I the Hamiltonian okay. is static. But I didn't say that we consider an eigenstate of the problem, and this will become clearer later. If we have uh, prepared a system not in an eigenstate, the system then will be free to evolve, and I it has, see. in fact, an energy spread. Okay, thanks. Great. That 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 answers I my didn't, question. Uh, yeah, Thank you. Mine, oh. Sorry, <laughs> Renate, please. To follow up on this because I thought now. Okay, so Andrea, you say delta E is clearly not. Let's say you have two states of an atom. It's not the energy difference between these two atomic states, right? You say it's now the variance of the initial state. That's the delta E, the energy variance of the initial state. Yeah, yeah exactly. So let's uh, consider an example that I believe okay. uh, everybody here is familiar with, is the Rabi oscillation. If you consider that, we have a system that is resonantly coupled. And then, you know, in the dressed uh, basis, uh, that uh, if you look at the eigenstate of the of the coupled system, then those are split by uh, an energy that is equal to the Rabi frequency that drives the system. So, and uh, if you prepare a superposition of spin up and spin down, so what you uh, uh, what you effectively have uh, realized at the beginning is to have a superposition of both uh, the eigenstates of the driven system. And so the energy spread is related to the uh, Rabi frequency itself. So the more you drive the system, the higher the energy uncertainty is in this case. And then you observe the Rabi oscillation. And that's, uh, I would say, the very simple system that uh, we understand very well. And uh, what we are now, uh, uh, what we set out to do is to investigate how it is bound, uh, what role this bound uh, play in more complex dynamics uh, where many levels are involved, as is the case of uh, a matter wave that is excited. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a uh, part of the story, then uh, there is, but the story is not finished here. And uh, it took uh, surprisingly 
some more years uh, for discovering a second type of bound, something again of fundamental character. And this was uh, due to Margolus and Levity uh, towards the end of the 90s. Um, and identify a different bound that is clearly a different functional shape and uh, set a different type of uh, uh, orthogonalization time. And I call this the margolus levitin orthogonalization time and tells us that there is a minimum time to reach an orthogonal state and is proportional to the inverse of the mean energy. So we see here that we have these two fundamental quantity, the mean energy and the energy uncertainty, and both of them uh, play an important role. And what we are going to do now with this experiment is to elucidate also their interplay between these two bounds, okay? And so to summarize here, what I said in this introduction, we have seen that there are two fundamental bounds on the quantum evolution rate. Uh, specifically considering the evolution of the of this quantity, the two time state overlap. One is uh, due to Mandelstam and Tam, and the other one from uh, Margolus and uh, Levitin. And this uh, bounds expressed in this way essentially answer to the question how small can the overlap be after a given time t? But uh, by simple algebraic uh, manipulation, we could rewrite these bounds in perhaps a more familiar form as you might encounter in the literature on quantum speed limit. This is nothing but uh, algebraic uh, manipulation of these bounds and uh, answering the question, how short can the time be to reach a given overlap with respect to the initial state? So this brings me now to the outline of my talk. Um, after this introduction, I'm going to present you um, first an experiment where we uh, put these two bound to the test and we learn how they intervene in a many level system as an excited matter wave. And then I, I switch to a, a related problem, a problem also more closely related to the original brachistochrone problem of uh, Bernoulli. And uh, I'll show you how here uh, some new twist uh, occurs in the story and how things change as we introduce uh, a drive. And Leandro already asked uh, this question before. And finally, some outlook about experiments and vision uh, for the future. So this uh, experiment is uh, the result of a collaboration uh, with the group of Joao Sagi at Technion. And uh, here are the main uh, players in this work that we have uh, now posted on the archive. Um, Manolo, um, Manolo Rivera Lam is uh, my student from my group and worked together with uh, Ganes, a student of uh, Joao Sagi. And uh, I had the pleasure to have Ganes for a period of time carrying out experiments uh, in Bonn. So it's uh, not everybody here in the audience is uh, an expert of cold atom system. Allow me to give you a short introduction on the basics of uh, the experiment. So we work with uh, uh, ultra cold atoms trapped in optical potentials. And in first uh, place, we consider uh, the optical potential resulting from an optical standing wave that is originating from two counterpropagating laser beams. And this uh, standing wave creates region of maximum a minima of the intensity and our atoms are trapped, uh, trapped where the intensity is at a maximum. And uh, here you see a fluorescence image of two cesium atoms taken uh, with our objective lens that features an unprecedented uh, numerical aperture. So one of the best you can find around and this gives us for the future beautiful capability of individually addressing these atoms in the lattice. But what is uh, for today most important is the fact that uh, these atoms come with um, two internal states at least that we can uh, control and define our qubit. And, uh, and here's the specialty of my group and what set us uh, apart from other experiments in optical lattices is the fact that we can create optical potential that act selectively on uh, the two uh, different internal states independently. This means that we can create an optical potential that traps atoms uh, exclusively in, uh, let's say, spin-up state, or um, an independent potential that selectively traps atom in the spin-down state. And this is important control, and you see very soon how we can uh, make use of this to uh, 
perform the test of the um, two uh, quantum speed limit bounds. So this is perhaps my only technical slide here for the interested audience that uh, wants to know how we realize these uh, two different optical potentials. These are two optical standing waves that are perfectly overlap in space and they come in different polarization of the photons. So here you see the first laser beam that interferes with a counter propagating laser beam. And this is of right circular polarization. And this is one standing wave. And then we overlap this standing wave with a second one of left circular polarization. And uh, because of the choice of the wavelength, we exploit an effect that uh, make the atoms in spin up be sensitive only to right circular polarization and atoms in spin down be sensitive only to left circular polarization optical traps. And uh, by controlling the phases through acoustic optic modulators of each individual laser beams, we are able to steer this optical standing wave with very high precision. And it's something that I'm quite proud of that ultimately we reach a precision of one angstrom in uh, setting uh, exactly the relative distance between these two overlap standing wave. And we can also drive this in time. Overall, this can be seen as a polarization synthesizer of polarization states of light, as in fact, by choosing the phases and the intensity, we can dial any polarization we want here with uh, high precision and very fast uh, within the time of a microsecond time scale. And I would argue that this is um, the most performing polarization synthesizer you could find around. So as I said, we work in the regime of ultra cold temperature. So we start with our atoms here uh, at our room temperature and we bring them down through uh, fairly standard laser cooling techniques uh, in the few micro Kelvin regime. And then we borrow some techniques from the trap ion community, namely laser uh, sideband cooling techniques to further reduce the temperature uh, and the entropy of these atoms and preparing them in the motional ground state with um, high reliability. So typically we get one or 2% error and uh, so with, let's say, 98, 99% uh, fidelity, we have atoms uh, prepared in the motional ground state of our optical potential. So now here is the challenge. We want to excite the matter wave. And in particular, we want to be able to measure directly the, this quantity, the two time state overlap, meaning the overlap or the time evolved state where the state at the origin. And the challenge is namely uh, related to the fact that uh, this seems a ill posed problem. How can one, through a direct measurement, uh, determine the overlap of the system evolving time with the system that has not yet evolved in time? And the solution uh, is provided by this tool that we have at hand, uh, namely the fact that we can manipulate a potential in a spin dependent fashion. So we can start as shown here in the illustration with the atom in the motional ground state, and then add a second optical standing wave, this time of different polarization. And these two standing waves are here represented uh, one on the bottom and one on the top, but in reality and the experiment are perfectly overlapped especially, but we can displace them and we can control this displacement very precisely. And now by applying a very fast pulse, we have set up a system with Raman pulses that achieves this in 50 or even less than 50 nanoseconds, we can nearly instantaneously create a superposition of both internal spin state. And now what we have realized here is essentially a copy of the same system, where in one case it populates an eigenstate of the system, and in the other state we have excited or we have prepared a highly excited state. And if now we let the time evolve, the state that has been excited, this will develop into a matter wave, while the other one populating a um, eigenstate will essentially remain there. And um, at most, it simply picks up a phase. Now, if we want to then determine the overlap of the time evolved state with the original state, what we have to do is to conclude this with a second very fast pulse. We use always our Raman pulses to close the interferometer. In this way, we are gonna measure now the overlap 
between these two way packets that expresses essentially how the time evolved state is matched to the mode of the original state. So if you are more familiar with optics, you can think of a laser beam that is split and then recombined. And if the beams that then are recombined are nicely mode matched, so you would see a high visibility. But if uh, the beam, meanwhile, is uh, drifted apart in, times of, in the terms of the mode, then the visibility would drop uh, significantly. So that's exactly what we do here in our experiment, where we record a so-called Ramsey fringe, scanning a Ramsey control parameter. And the contrast of this fringe exactly reflects the overlap of the time evolved state in spin up or the time evolved state in spin down. But if you remember, I just said, that the state in spin down is an eigenstate of the system. So essentially we could replace easily the time t with time t equals zero. And also if you remember the state in spin down is a copy of the state in spin up so that we can write the contrast in this form. And you see how this is a tool this fast matter wave interferometry is a tool that allows us to directly measure this quantity without using any type of quantum tomography, trying to reconstruct exactly the state and then computing a posteriori uh, this uh, overlap. As the system uh, Andrea, is exciting, Andrea, please. Can, I, can I ask you something? Why do you say they're a copy? So you perform, you start from the system in the in the ground state of your hyperfine structure, and then you, you make a fast pulse to send part of its population to the excited one. So you're saying that they end up in a 50-50 superposition that's what you're calling a copy or, or? Yes, probably copy is an improper term, but is a superposition of mm -hmm. uh, spin up and spin down state. And from the point of view of the emotional degrees of freedom, uh, I would argue that in that sense, it's a copy. So we are essentially uh, having the same wave function at time zero uh, that is in spin up and spin down. Okay. But these two um, wave packets will have a very different evolution in time. Right, okay. So this is how we create the excitation. And the, as we were saying, it's a, for this first experiment is a time independent system. But if we create now a superposition of different uh, motional states, then as they pick up different phases, the system evolves as you've just seen in the little uh, movies. And what we are measuring is this uh, two time state overlap that can also be uh, written in this form. It's a sum of a different terms uh, with weights that essentially account for the population of the different state that we have excited and the phases that depends on the energy of these states. And these are the experimental uh, result is showing a, a trace, a long trace, where we measure this quantity. And as this quantity is a complex object, we are able here to plot the real and imaginary part. And these are not a random uh, oscillation, but actually um, contain much physics about the system. And in fact, by modeling this, we are able to reconstruct this uh, weight coefficients about occupation at different levels and the spectrum included. Um, this is very interesting as a tool for inspecting the system. But uh, for today's talk, I'm more interested about the very short time dynamics, as this is the place where the Margolis, Levitin, and Mandelstam time bound apply. And so we are going to zoom in in this uh, very short time uh, uh, domain. And we are going to look now at different uh, type of realization. And here are three representative data set sets as we increase the displacement of, uh, of our lattice potential. That means that we are creating this uh, wave packet at time zero further and further away from the bottom of the potential itself. And in a way, we are creating higher and higher excitations. And this is expressed now in units lambda over two uh, represents the distance between uh, two lattice sites. So seems that there is some problem with the audio, I continue. So what we see in these three data sets is that uh, by increasing the excitation, clearly the dynamics get shorter, uh, is shorter with respect to small excitation. And also we uh, see that, uh, and perhaps this is the first uh, thing that one notices 
is that in all three uh, examples here, both uh, bounds are fulfilled. So we have all data points outside of the excluded um, regions. Um, if we consider higher excitation, this is the case where our data points get closer to the Mandelstam-Tam bound. Okay. But we also see that in this case, the margolis levitin bound essentially plays okay. no real role. Leandro, uh, shall I continue or we? Let me just, let me just, um, it seems please guys, there is, some, in, in the there is someone, there is someone that is not muted. I can see it appears as Andrew Chopra, please um, mute, mute yourself guys. Otherwise, it makes no sense for me to ask to Ravi to to give us all the right to to speak, right? I can see someone that is not uh, muted. Please, um, everybody should be muted while not speaking. Okay, this is very annoying for the speaker. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Sorry, Andrea. Yeah, thank you very this much, Leandro. It doesn't very, annoy me, but I'm not sure if it's so, so clear for the others. Yeah, um, thank you so much. So there is the case here on the right where all points are constrained by the Mandelstam time bound. But and this is uh, when we carry out the experiment was for us the most surprising uh, finding here is that we found situation where we observe a crossover from being constrained from the Mandelstam time bound into the region of times where the Margolus Levitin bound what was setting the limit for the quantum evolution rate. So you clearly see that here the points cannot get too close to the Mandelstam time bound because the Margolus Levitin bound kicks in and completely excludes this um, region. So the time at which this occurs, we call it this critical time for the crossover. And we carry out some further, further experiment, experiment to investigate, investigate it. I'm sorry, Leandro, I see, I hear my voice coming back because of this problem of the, uh, can we disable? Um, see, so yeah, I continue to see somebody, must be... I continue to see somebody that is, that was not muted. I just muted him now. Um, Did you? Okay. It should, yeah, it should be fine. I'm sorry for this. I don't uh, know. I will need to solve this um, later, but we can hear you well, yeah. Andrea. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So continuing, um, yes, we carry out uh, experiments to understand uh, how this crossover occurs. And uh, the origin of the crossover is inherent to the different functional forms of the, the two bounds, as one is related to the energy uncertainty and the other one to the mean energy in a different way. And here there is a square root appearing. And the crossover occurs when the margolus levitin bound uh, is uh, higher when this quantity is higher than the Mandelstam uh, curve. And this, uh, after a simple algebraic manipulation, one would find that this occurs when the time is higher than or longer than a critical time that is an expression of the ratio of the mean energy with respect to the energy uncertainty. So we could rewrite this condition for the margolus levitin regime when the crossover occurs as a condition on the mean energy being smaller than energy uncertainty or equivalently expressed in terms of the orthogonalization times when the margolis levitin orthogonalization time is longer than the Mandelstam time one. And we look uh, in, uh, at this question, uh, realizing different experiments under different conditions. And this diagram here will now express our data point as a function of uh, the inverse of the margolis levitin orthogonalization time, which is an expression of the mean energy versus the energy uncertainty. And this is the region where we expect and where we also find this crossover between the two uh, bounds. And for all other data points, the crossover is not simply occurring. And here we see three different data sets for n equal zero, n equal one, and n equal two. So meaning preparing different states. And in the case of n equals zero is uh, rather similar to uh, more classical states, but we have also the possibility to create highly non-classical states like n equal one and n equal two. And I want to emphasize this point that points here on the right hand side uh, are points at the high mean energy. And this occurs when we are placing the wave packet right on top of our potential here. 
And in this case, uh, so our way packet clearly couples into the continuum. So we are creating a superposition of not just a few uh, motional states, but rather a continuum of states. And the way packet is completely free to tunnel away and fly away from the lattice. And so this gives a, a wide range of parameters that we can scan with the system. And we identify this as the region where the Mar Margolis Levitin uh, bound plays a role and to understand why is this the case and uh, the question that immediately uh, popped up uh, to us was was this, is this a rather uh, usual situation or something very specific of our experiment uh, to answer this question it helps to recognize an analogy here with a simple Two level system, the case of a qubit. If we have very small mean energies, so small excitation, in this case, our matter wave is rather confined at the bottom of the potential, and we uh, nearly populate uh, a tiny bit of the first uh, motional uh, state. In this case, essentially, two levels are occupied, and the dynamics can be uh, reduced to that of a qubit, and we see from the theoretical expectation that the qubit case of exactly a two-level system is uh, within the Margolis Levitin regime. So uh, ultimately, the answer to this question, I would say, is rather yes and affirmative. And the Margolis Levitin regime is a rather uh, typical situation that occurs, uh, especially when we have uh, uh, fewer levels. And it's also instructive to consider the case of uh, a coherent state uh, for which the energy spectrum follows a Poissonian distribution. In this case, we see that uh, the theoretical curve nicely fits our experimental data for small mean energies. However, we also see that when the mean energy increases further and further, we clearly depart away from this picture of semi-classical state, as in fact, when we have populated uh, essentially with our matter wave, uh, the top of the heel of the potential, there the potential is not even anymore confining, but is anti-confining. So we don't, we are not even in a harmonic approximation, but it's a, an anti-harmonic potential. So this is a great range of uh, experimental condition that we could analyze. And in, the, in this different experimental setting, we look uh, at the second question, how Trust far... Question. Uh, just having a question. Uh, you had uh, the n equals zero, n equal uh, one, and so on. Uh, can you please explain uh, briefly uh, again what n is? Well, yes. n is the vibrational state. n equals zero is when we have prepared atoms in the fundamental uh, motional state. And uh, with a slight variation of the technique, uh, so we can then uh, drive sideband transitions so we can uh, uh, induce a spin flip that at the same time also changes the emotional state and we can after having cool atoms to the emotional ground state we can on demand prepare atoms in n equal one or also n equal two or higher excited states addressing them specifically um, this is the way we start preparing the initial wave package the second question we address is how close or how far we get from the bound and what determines deviations from this bound. And to tackle this question, it came into help a geometric picture that has been introduced first by Aranov and Anandan. And namely the fact that uh, the Hilbert space of quantum state is a metric space. Um, a metric space means it's a space that possesses a metric, a notion of distance. So if we have the, our initial state and a state at time t, we can define the distance between them uh, in terms of the Fubini study metric. And this Fubini study metric or distance uh, amounts to be the arcosine of the two time state overlap that is exactly the quantity that we can measure in our experiment. And this is something beautiful because also shows that with our experiment, we can precisely measure the distance between time evolved state and the state at the origin. This distance also turns out to be equal to the geodesic uh, length. So to the length of the shortest path connecting the state at zero to the state at time t. However, uh, when the system evolves, it's not granted and actually generally does not occur that the system evolves along the geodesic. 
So the system naturally dictated by the, so with its evolution dictated by the Schrodinger equation will evolve along a different curve that is not necessarily the geodesic. We see that it's the geodesic for the two level system driven presently, but in general for a multi-level system, this can differ. And it was a key observation by Aronov and Anandan that uh, the speed at which the system evolves in this metric space is given exactly by the energy uncertainty delta E. So a system with a static Hamiltonian will evolve in this metric space at a constant speed, and the path can be longer than geodesic. If the system would evolve along the geodesic, then for the same time, would generally reach a, a further apart point. So this gives us the possibility to express the Mandelstam time bound in a rather intuitive form from the point of view of geometric. And this is the Mandelstam time bound now taking uh, this uh, type of geometric interpretation where we are saying that the path covered by the quantum state evolving is generally longer than the geodesic path. So this is the, the length of the shortest path. And so taking and uh, considering this object, the path covered by the system is something that we can measure is we can measure delta E. And as well, we can measure the two time state overlap as I explained before. Now we express the uh, um, path covered by the state, um, considering the Schrodinger equation in a power uh, series in terms of fraction of the time, in terms of the Mandelstam time or transition time. And uh, here we have this parameter C, and this parameter C represents our deviation coefficient. So generally, this length is longer than the geodesic length. So this term here in square bracket must be smaller than one. So we expect that this coefficient C is bigger than zero, and actually it's equal to zero when the Mandelstam time bound is saturated. And this parameter C is what we could measure in the experiment under this different experimental condition. And also what I'm now plotting here in this diagram uh, versus the energy uncertainty on the X axis. And one striking finding of this measurement is there is this coalescence of all points around a value of C around uh, one. And this is a, in a way an important finding because it shows to us that uh, yes, the system does not evolve along a geodesic as uh, the path cover is generally longer, but the correction is small because when this parameter C is of the order of one, then uh, the prefactor pi square divided by 48 is a small number. And overall, what we have here, it's a small correction. We see, however, that there are situations, especially for uh, small energy uncertainties, where the deviation is strong. And to understand this, we look at the expression of C in terms of what it derives from the Schrodinger equation. Now in the Schrodinger equation, we know that C is related to the kurtosis. So the kurtosis is a difficult word for saying the tailness of the spectral distribution that we are creating with our excitation. So it tells us how heavy or how important the tails of our distributions are. And uh, we consider the case of a qubit. In the case of a qubit, theoretically, we can compute the expectation. And we see that for small energy uncertainties, when we have small excitation, indeed, the qubit prediction nicely captures uh, our experimental data. And we have seen before that this is the case when the margolis levitin bound kicks in. And in fact, this prevents uh, the system from following closely the Mandelstam time bound, as in fact, this is now a diagram that quantifies the deviation from the Mandelstam time bound. But in general, for higher excitation, we generally recognize that there is this coalescence of points at a, with C at around uh, one, and we see a nice uh, interpolating curve when we consider the Poissonian excitation, that this is the, an energy spectrum that capture the excitation of a coherent state. And uh, this nicely interpolates between the higher uh, excited states and uh, small and low excited states that essentially reduce to a qubit. And we see how nicely um, this is now captured. Now sorry, coming to sorry, the second can I ask a question? Sorry, excuse me. Yes, please. Hi, uh, just, just uh, back in the others, like uh, what does exactly mean like, like, in, like uh, physically? 
in, in terms of what's happening in the system that the path that the evolution takes is never the geodesical like length, like distance. Does that mean does that mean that, that the, the evolution never takes the shorter the shorter uh, uh, path possible? Like what, what are the consequences of that, that statement yeah. in terms of, in, of physics? So first is what you just said, that if we create an excitation like this, uh, following the Schrodinger equation, the system will not evolve along uh, the shortest path. So you could uh, attempt to redesign, engineer the system in a way that uh, produce uh, an evolution along the geodesic. This is not forbidden. And in fact, it is indeed realized if you can couple the initial and final state through a direct coupling, realizing a, a resonant Rabi oscillation between initial and final state. Uh, but the second thing that we learn here is that while it is known from the community of quantum speed limit that indeed uh, system, the system evolves along the geodesic only for a two-level system, we see that for a multi-level system as ours, while we are not uh, saturating the bound, we are also not getting that far away so that the bound itself still provides a meaningful time scale for the dynamics of the system. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So one, so comment. Th one comment. Thank you very much, Renato, for the question. I'm very happy when students have questions. Another comment um, here: we're all many people are logged in as Andrew Chopra. So I suggest that um, the speak the people when they want to ask questions that they turn on their camera so that Andrea can see the human being um, speaking because they all they all appear as Andrew Chopra. So your names are not appearing there. Um, so just just a suggestion. Thank you so much, guys. Excellent, excellent talk, Andrea. Please continue. This is very exciting. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Leandro. And thank you to everybody also asking questions. A really good question and help the other also to, to follow. Thank you. So now coming to the second part of the talk, I want to hey, show Andrea, how before, before you things... do this, sorry, I can't turn on the camera. It's not possible, um, but I think you know me. <laughs> but your, um, your picture is one of the only ones that has, that's appearing. So we which shows, yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine. <laughs> hey, so, so Andrea, I'm, 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 okay, so I'm confused about, about, still I'm confused about the energy uncertainty and about the energy, what this really means in the system. So I tell you what I think it means and you tell me where I go wrong. Okay, so I thought now you start with an, with an initial state and then there is a an, uh, unitary evolution of this initial state. And I would be thinking now as the state evolves, the energy uncertainty also evolves. Huh? So delta E changes. Is this correct or is this wrong? Yeah, it generally can change. And thank you very much for the question. Also, good clarification at this point. But so for the case considered here of a static Hamiltonian, then the energy uncertainty is related to the variance of the Hamiltonian operator. Or if you want, is the square root of the variance. Okay, so it's constant. Any, any observable that is constructed from the Hamiltonian will be a constant of motion, if you want. It will not change in time because it's a time-independent system. Okay. And so in this okay. case, particular, the energy uncertainty will be preserved for the old time. Okay, perfect. So this means you set the energy uncertainty by setting the initial state. Yes, kind of. so, the, okay. so the initial state determines the mean energy and also the energy uncertainty ah, as okay. any other moment derived from the energy. Okay, or okay. From the and, okay, but there you can set different ones. And then I, I think I, I somehow didn't didn't I didn't understand the experimental part exactly. So you first you, you have your atom, cool it to the ground state, and then would you then also I mean you split it, I understood. And then you would also populate different motional states. Or, or how would you prepare kind of this initial state? And, or how would you change the, the initial mean energy and the initial variance of this initial state? I think you explained yeah. it, but I somehow didn't. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry. So our control parameter, we, we don't have infinite control. Uh, we could, in principle, to make the thing simple, so we use as a control parameter the shift of uh, the potential that atoms in spin up experience with respect to the potential in spin down. So this delta x is something that we can control with angstrom precision. So way sub nanometer precision, we can define this delta x. And as we then create the superposition of the two state, at this point, we put the wave package uh, on this steep slope. 
Now you see here, if I put the Webpack rather here, I have excited something with a rather large energy uncertainty because here the potential is steep and my way packet is uh, uh, generally as a certain width. And so this gives a quite large spread of energies that you are populating uh, here. Yeah, yeah, okay, nice. The, okay. I can increase the mean energy if I would put the way packet rider right here on top of the potential lead. That was I was referring before to at. And indeed, we do experiment like this. And I present data points that correspond to this case. We put the wave packet here. When the wave packet is here, then the mean energy is the highest, but the energy uncertainty smallest. is not the highest. Yeah, gotcha. and not even the smallest. The smallest is when we are in the ground state. When we put the wave packet here, then uh, it's uh, the energy uncertainty is small because the potential is, uh, uh -huh. is not very steep. But not zero because we are not an eigenstate of the of the ah, yeah. okay. of the potential. Okay, very good. No, super. Very very intuitive explanation. Thanks. Fantastic. That's exactly what I was was missing. Good. Okay. Perfect. Super. Andre, I have another question. Actually, I had to ask. Uh, so I'm Luigi. Uh, Hi, so Luigi. I, yeah, I have another question uh, that I sh actually should have asked before, but I think I had this kind of problems so with with the sound. Say. Uh, I um, let me under, let me double check. So these um, bounds that you um, that exist, so this uh, the two bounds. Uh, I I understand that they refer to non-interacting particles, right? So it's a uh, one particle. Is it correct? This is correct. However, I think these bounds would also apply for interacting systems. Mm. And uh, we didn't experiment with that. It would be beautiful to do so. And I believe there is nothing that prevents this bound to apply also to interacting systems. Oh, indeed. I, I mean, mean your experiments yeah. uh, it contains kind of interaction. So I think uh, the, you, with your experiment, you in, yeah, indirectly proved a piece of the story that somehow this bound somehow work. I don't know why and in what sense, also for in presence of interaction, which is uh, very remarkable, I think. Okay, so let me see. So interactions between atoms here in our experiment are not yet explored, if is that what you are referring to. Mm. Well, how come? Because I mean, these are, you have a bosic condensate, no? So there are a few- No, these are single atoms uh, are trapped one, in this- okay. uh, Yeah, are, you, so you control one atom. These are uh, single atoms at the time that have been probed. Okay. okay. Um, but I, I'm with you, so I think this would be very interesting to explore this in oh, the yeah. in the regime of interactions. And these bounds need to apply also there. And indeed, we cover one piece of the story, but one can learn also something for interacting systems. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now to the second part of the talk, it comes to um, something closer to the original problem set by Bernoulli on the Brachistock road, some problem slide. Okay, so we are asking the question how we can optimally drive the system from uh, uh, one side to a distant location in the shortest time as possible. And this, in this kind of setting, we are allowing the system to change in time. So we have a time-driven Hamiltonian. And one possibility would be uh, the boring way so it would be to follow an antibiotic transfer, but this would take a very long time. And if we are encoding some quantum information inside internal state of the atom, this information might well have deco here before we reach the adjacent side. So this is not the right way to go. Instead, we could uh, consider uh, an idealized case, but this is somehow instructive to consider where we don't have any bound on the energy. So we assume that we can control infinitely high energies in our system with our money potential that is unconstrained. In this case, there is no limit how fast we can perform this transformation, at least within non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. So we start with a linear transport, and then this excites our motion excitation. But then if we time the transport correctly, we can completely refocus excitation uh, down to the ground state and we reach our target state. 
This, however, would not work if we have, as in any realistic condition, a system where we can control only a finite amount of energy. And this is here represented by the top of our potential. So there is a cap. Maybe this is determined by the laser power that we have available or any other physical constraint that uh, is there. And in this case, if we transport the system along a linear transport ramp, as we have just seen before, eventually the system will not return to the emotional ground state, but we leave the system in some wobbling state, which is not good. And we want to rather improve the overlap of the transporter state with our target state. So our figure of merit is this fidelity. And we have established protocols that allow us to precisely measure this fidelity. And we have uh, worked together with our theory partners. Uh, so Simone Montangero, Tommaso Calarco, Antonio Negretti for the theory of uh, quantum optimal control to optimize the transport of atoms in the best possible way. And here comes control into play. And this is a bit the story of the waiter that wants to reach uh, the next table in a very short time, is in a hurry. And before accelerating, it tilts slightly the tray to avoid the champagne to spill over. And uh, we use similar trait here to transport our atoms. So the point of departure, these are shortcuts um, to adiabaticity, something that uh, one of the uh, absolute expert is uh, Gonzalo Muga from Bilbao. So instead of transporting the atoms linearly in time, we rather set uh, some discontinuous jump. And then uh, this pr provides us already a good starting point. And this is only the initial ansatz uh, to the quantum uh, optimal control uh, problem. And why is are these jumps uh, beneficial? For the reason that if we consider the uh, dynamics from the point of view of the co-moving reference frame, so the reference frame moving uh, together with the optical lattice as it is driven or our optical trap. So as we start to accelerate, then uh, the potential would get uh, tilted and the minimum of the potential is then shifted. However, if we allow, this would uh, naturally create quite some important excitation of motion. However, if we allow uh, a jump of the potential position as well before accelerating, then we can make such that we recenter the uh, minimum of the potential with respect to the way packet, and this minimizes in a way motional excitation. But it cannot just prevent completely motional excitation because our potential is anharmonic. And as we increase the acceleration more and more, so the tilt becomes larger and larger, and eventually the confinement becomes less and less. And that's where then optimal control plays an important role. <clears throat> Second uh, jump occurs uh, just in between. For similar reasons, this uh, prevents, again, uh, to displace the wave packets away from uh, the minimum uh, of the potential. And this is. Uh, the solution that comes out of this optimal quantum control problem. And you see that it still reminds of the initial jump here as the potential start with a rather uh, energetic acceleration to set the atom uh, rapidly on the flank of the potential to impart a strong acceleration. And then there are some uh, wobbling and jiggling of the potential to avoid, so to control this quantum fluctuation of the wave package um, because the system does not react instantaneously. So we are doing experiments, so we need to deal with that. And so we are dealing with a procedure that oversteer, uh, overdrive the system to eventually realize, so this is to, counteract in a way the finite response time of the system and by overdriving like this what we realize and these are measured data is that the optical potential follows nicely the trajectory that indeed our uh, quantum control theory tells us it, it, it should be and with this at hand with this tool at hand we did the experiment and these are the main results and we see that uh, for all transport times uh, that are relatively long then uh, our transport fidelity is within the experimental uh, 
precision or error bars compatible with uh, unity fidelity. However, there is a point as we decrease further and further the time when then the fidelity suddenly drops down and there is no way that we can then recover the fidelity. Uh, and in this way, we observe this transition from a quantum controllable to a quantum non-controllable uh, system um, and so in this way we observe here uh, the quantum uh, brachistochrome time this is essentially the the shortest time uh, with which we can perform this uh, transformation uh, with uh, relatively high fidelity and uh, it's uh, uh, instructive and uh, quite uh, insightful to look at the question how this compares with the Mandelstam time bound that we learned from the first part of the talk and we see here, this is the region that is uh, excluded and hatched out by the Mandelstam time bound. And we immediately see one thing is that this time scale, it doesn't match with the time scale we observe in the experiment. There is an important mismatch, and I will come back to this in, in a moment, uh, because I think here is something that we have learned when we carry out this experiment. And also we were able to determine a second different bound using some geometric argument that instead better captures the right time scale for the quantum brachistochrome time of our experiment. Essentially, we are excluding this region, but you see now we're getting more close to what uh, is indeed doable uh, with uh, the experiment. And the final uh, points I want to emphasize here in this experiment is uh, the comparison with the linear transport uh, protocol. In that case, we achieve significantly lower fidelities. It's nice to see these uh, revivals as uh, in fact there are magic times for which we refocus motional excitations, but these revivals are not perfect because of anharmonicity, because we are not dealing with an infinitely deep uh, potential. And the other thing I, I, I like to, to, to emphasize here is the high uh, data quality where there is such a nice match between uh, experimental point and our theoretical expectation, revealing that we also have a nice uh, protocol for measuring uh, this fidelity of the transport fidelity. But back to the physical question, how does it come that the Mandelstam time bound kind of fail to describe the right time scale of this uh, process? So here is a reminder of uh, the inequality we have encountered in the first part of the talk. So generally, as I said before, this Mandelstam time bound can be saturated when we have a Rabi oscillation resonantly driving two level system. And this can be done, for example, if we have these weight packets when there is a local coupling that couples them, and then this could be realized. However, if we consider the transport, so when we want to reach a far apart state, a state that is far away in terms of the width of the weight packet, when the overlap between the initial and the final state is vanishing, then there is uh, no way that through a local coupling operator, we can induce this rabbit oscillation between them. In other words, it's essentially impossible to teleport a matter wave or a atomic wave packet of a massive particle from point A to point B without passing through the intermediate states. So what the Mandelstam time uh, does fail to do is to give proper account of all state in this metric space of the Hilbert space that the wave packet must travel across if we want to reach from point A to point B. So if you look here at this expression, it happens that as we increase the distance further and further, if we get transport much further away than the width of the wave packet, then uh, the overlap vanishes between the initial and target state. So that this quantity gets to zero and the R cosine of zero tends to pi over two and does not grow any further. And it would not be hard to argue that the energy uncertainty of this process does scale with the square root of the distance D in such a way that if we increase the distance further and further, the Mandelstam time bound comes to a seemingly absurd conclusion that the minimum time must be bigger than zero. And this is revealing a completely wrong scaling and not really helpful uh, dynamics. So luckily we could uh, improve on that and we could provide a different type of explanation that does uh, properly take into account 
the state in between that the system has passed across. We come up with a different scaling uh, uh, where this is the distance in terms of lattice site. And for us in the experiment, D was equal to one. So that essentially the quantum brachistochrone time uh, was uh, of the order um, had to be longer than the oscillation period uh, in the harmonic approximation. And this reveal in a way a fact or emphasizes an important fact that to speed up your uh, dynamics, you need to control more and more energy resources. So you need to have deeper and deeper potential. It's maybe some obvious conclusion, but is uh, in a way very sharply emphasized here, how the minimum time depends on the harmonic uh, oscillation period and the way on the depth of the, the potential and also our data point reveal uh, this uh, behavior uh, that follow this uh, expected uh, curve. Now, as we um, accumulate a little bit of delay, I would say that I would just uh, probably uh, move only very quickly over the outlook part, uh, just mentioning that uh, our group, we have been working on the realization of discrete time quantum walks and this is a powerful uh, platform as a quantum simulator and also much more than this and allows us to delocalize matter waves in this state dependent lattice potential. And we have been doing uh, some work on, on this already for quite some time, including some fundamental tests of quantum superposition states, studying the coherence model, even interacting system. And we are now setting out to do experiments in two dimensions. And we are constructing an apparatus that uh, indeed uh, extends the concept of state dependent optical uh, traps to two dimensions. So we have a 3D lattice, but we can move in a plane state dependently. And this is the apparatus and we are so much looking forward to experiments uh, in, uh, in this two dimensional system. And one of the things I envision for the future, this possibility inspired by beautiful experiments in photonics uh, of quantum circuits. And I know that you had uh, Fabio Charino as your guest and speaker not long ago, presenting some beautiful experiment of boson sampling with this machine. One of the challenges in photonics are losses. And one of my hope is to use uh, ultra cold systems uh, of ultra cold atoms of indistinguishable atoms to realize in a, a similar fashion quantum circuits that are entirely uh, programmable and perhaps with some new twist, including the possibility of having interactions uh, between atoms and something that we have done in the past to realize uh, a non commandal interference between indistinguishable atoms. And here is just uh, one possible experiment that is already highly, uh, uh, for me, inspiring with uh, two indistinguishable atoms about revealing quantum statistics with a pair of distant atoms. And this is an instance already of an interesting quantum circuits, maybe more interesting for physical and philosophical perspective rather than technological one, but I believe there is a great potential to grow also for quantum technologies. And this brings me now to the conclusion, um, as we are a little bit behind of time, just speed up through uh, the the points uh, that I presented. So these are two fundamental bounds that we have now tested on the quantum evolution rate. And we are seeing the crossover between them in a, in a single uh, setting. And uh, we have shown that uh, indeed these bounds provide a meaningful time scale for the evolution of a quantum system for time independent uh, Hamiltonian. But also in the second experiment, we have revealed that uh, some limitation when it comes uh, to a um, multi-level system that where we reach states that are not connected through local operations. And there we see some failing of the Mandelstam time bound. We realize this with optimal quantum control and we have seen the transition between quantum controllable to quantum non-controllable system. And also I emphasize how important is the role of energy that can be controlled in the system. And with that, I conclude and I thank you very much for your attention and also for the many questions that I've already received. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the fantastic talk. This is really, really wonderful physics and uh, very clear. Thank you so much. Um, thank you also for being punctual uh, with the timing. But we, you, you did get lots of questions. I guess there are some more questions uh, from the audience. I would um, give preference to students. So Renato today asked a question already. If there is some other young um, student uh, or postdoc that wants to start with the questions, 
um, then um, then you can go ahead. Otherwise, I guess that Luigi and Rene may be there, perhaps with some more questions. Yeah, Leandro. Uh, yeah, I have a, a very quick question. You okay, think? Carlos. Thank you. Yeah, Carlos. So uh, so, I mean, so present yourself because he cannot. The, the speaker yeah, cannot see you. I, I cannot turn on the camera. All right. I don't have any option to do so. Just yeah. oh, yeah, I see. A PhD student here at PAI. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, um, I have a question related to one of the last figures, the, the one that you show the fidelity of the uh, initial state and the target state. Um, can you put the one of the last slides that you showed? It's a very quick question, but yeah, that one. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't understand how it's possible that for the optimal quantum control, uh, sometimes the fidelity is larger than one. How can that be possible? So this is related to our detection technique, how we detect the, the fidelity or the population in the emotional uh, ground state. And uh, the procedure uh, involves some losses and we have to renormalize by this. Mm. There are some statistical fluctuation and sometimes uh, uh, this uh, leads to something higher than one. Uh, mm -hmm. You should bear with me that we have now taken a lot of data points and with single atoms. So this took some time and indeed this error bars can be made smaller by increasing the statistics. But mm -hmm. here we want to really investigate a wide range of, uh, of times. I see, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for the question. Does anybody else? Um, we have, yeah, we're already a bit uh, behind schedule, but um, one or two more short questions we can we can afford um, if anyone wants to ask something. Um, uh, yeah, I have, I have a, like a very <laughs> basic question, more like a philosophical one. I just wrote this down, okay, where you said, hey, you, you started your talk with a, with a time energy uncertainty, uncertainty relation. You said there are these problems, right? And then you said one problem is that time is not an, an, is not an observable in the quantum mechanical sense. Can you, can you say what is, what is the issue? With this, what do you exactly what do you exactly mean by this? Well, uh, you know, probably this is a question more for theorists, but there is uh, ways to give proper sense of this uncertainty relation between delta x and delta p in terms of uh, in the operational sense and in the sense of operators. Mm -hmm. But uh, what does it exactly mean? Uh, a spread or RMS of time. Um, so back then, at uh, the time of the Heisman, there was great debate, and also von Neumann was involved into this and many others. And at best, what they provided were examples of a physical setting where uh, it's, uh, it, it was kind of providing the order of magnitude uh, for determining a certain energy or determining a given state on the minimum time that needs to be uh, investigated the system. But um, it was not uh, clearly um, and operationally specified. And I think what Amanda Stam and Tam here did is to provide a rigorous way to give a procedural or operational way to define uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty relation for time and energy. Okay. Cool. Um, can I ask yeah, something I, else? I also oh, have sorry. A, a very, oh, Luigi, go ahead then. Yes, yes please. I also have a, a say kind of a very general question or comment. Say, uh, it's again with the interactions concerning this. Um, so you said that this, actually these bounds, uh, uh, you, you can found these bounds also in presence of interaction, right? But uh, say, um, you know for sure that actually there is a, say, one of the, Say important problems nowadays is understanding this uh, so kind of thermalization. No? So you bring the system out of equilibrium, then you uh, try to understand what is the, uh, the asymptotic behavior you know, when the time uh, increase. And of course, this has to do with overlap between wave functions, right? So uh, I, I think that. Uh, uh, this bounds, uh, I expect at least my, naively, that this bounds uh, should be very affected by interaction. Uh, so, uh, uh, is, uh, is it true or, or not? Because, I mean, otherwise, I mean, thermalization does not depend on interaction, right? 
but so but the the delta e will change luigi i mean when you include oh, interactions I'm talking, I'm talking about ah, okay so the, the, delta the, e. the bound i think the bound is general it works for any hamilton once you fix the initial hamiltonian if i understood correctly but then when you have interactions your delta okay. e, your delta e will delta accommodate e to that. If I, right, right, right. I, I, have, I, I would guess. I, uh, I, I don't know, Andrea, if this makes this sense. Sounds reasonable. What, so I would, I would second your answer on this. Hmm. But, yeah. Um, hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. But, um, so, so one one last one last thing I wanted to ask Andrea. So all these optimal. So the optimal control that you do, right? This this is of course optimized for the initial weight packet, which in your case was the, the the ground state, right? And of course, I guess that you will have different optimal paths for each initial different each different initial stage, right? Um, so this this thing yes. is like for moving, like you have to know delicately in which state you are, so as to move it in close to an optimal way, right? Uh, that's uh, that's what you yeah you need to be you need to know from which state you start mm -hmm. however uh if you are ready to give up uh to some execution time so to make the protocol right. longer mm -hmm. i believe this can be optimized for more uh motional states that they would be preserved and I see. in general of course it's a question of controllability what kind of transformation can be done so can you map um, the first three or four motional states into I see. Again, the first four motional states given an arbitrary unitary, and uh, mm. this okay. this is a challenging problem, especially because we have an unbounded system, so we we don't have a cap on the energy. Right. 